welcome everyone in this uh, uh, new episode of john conway's patriot seminar series uh, we have the honor to have uh, professor balash uh, sandroy uh, he's uh, he has a kind of uh, uh, association with lams because one of uh, his phd student ha happened to be our colleague here uh, dr imran qureshi uh, Professor Balaj uh, has research interests including algebraic geometry, string theory, and network science. Besides many other contributions, he introduced the notion of non commutative Donaldson Thomas invariant. And in his new paper with other collaborators, they generalized classical Sylvester theorem for, from two polynomials to arbitrary number of polynomials. Uh, he also spearheading the efforts of developing mathematics in Africa by organizing regular events uh, since almost a decade. Uh, he's also uh, having a position in the Commission for Developing Countries uh, of the European Mathematical Society. And uh, uh, we are, we are, we really welcome him. And uh, just to let him know that uh, LUMS uh, is also the Emerging Regional Center of Excellence by the Europe, declared by the European Mathematical Society. And uh, there are a number of projects uh, where we are associated with European Mathematical Society for the development of mathematical research culture in Pakistan. And this uh, John Conway Spirited Seminars is, a, is, a, is an episode of it. So let's uh, welcome our speaker, Palash. Over to you now. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yeah, perfect. Oh, perfect. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Imran, for this uh, for this uh, introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking to you. Uh, so, indeed, my closest connection to Pakistan is through through Imran and 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 his fellow student at the time, um, So Ali Bal also who was a student at Warwick, but I also knew him him very well. I think I haven't had the opportunity to meet the rest of you, but it's great to um, speak to you um, in this context. Um, so I will tell you about something um, that I've um, recently started working on, maybe a year or two ago, with a collaborator from Nigeria, actually. So this is uh, this part line of research was also part of um, this work that Iran already referred to of 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 working with with colleagues in Africa, um, as I'll mention mention later. But the starting point is very classical, but maybe it's it's not so well known, and some aspects of it are maybe not so well known. So I thought that um, I'll tell you the story, which is Erhard theory, um, Erhard theory of polytopes, and it connects very closely to a subject that um, that is very close to my close to my heart, which is graded rings in algebraic geometry. That was the subject of um, Imran Qureshi's thesis also back back in the days, and and um, I've kept in touch with that subject also. Uh, myself. Um, so the starting point, though, is um, kind of very classical um, um, and very combinatorial. But before I get there, I just wanted to, to tell you that I am an algebraic geometer. Many of you um, know algebraic geometry. I know um, you're interested in that. Some others may not know it so well. So I wanted to just start with a couple of slides of what I, what I actually really do. So I work with geometric spaces defined by polynomial equations. So that's really the starting point of algebraic geometry. Um, as it happens, I mean, there'll be plenty of polynomials in this talk. You don't, you won't really see polynomial equations in this talk. Those will remain somewhat implicit. I will focus on, on the combinatorics um, and, um, uh, and almost the sort of number theory. Uh, but, but you can, um, but, but they are very much there. So that's very much part of the context. So just, just a quick example, so a real plane conic, um, for example, is, is an object in algebraic geometry, which is, this is something we, we teach in uh, university courses. So some curve in R2 given by a quadratic polynomial equation. For example, it could be the unit circle, which we can even draw. This goes back to, of course, high school mathematics. So the unit circle is an example of, a, of an object in algebraic geometry. Um, and more abstractly, um, algebraic geometry works with rings, polynomial rings. And so in this example, the polynomial ring would be the ring of two um, indeterminates, x and y, over the field of real numbers, because I said that I'm working over the real numbers, and modulo um, this quadratic uh, polynomial relation. So somehow there is a close connection between polynomial equations, so the equations that define my geometric object, and the rings for example, this ring of polynomials modulo 
an ideal, and the ideal here is a principal ideal generated by by one uh, one equation. So these are the sorts of rings that that come up in in algebraic geometry. And if you start studying algebraic geometry, then this dictionary between rings and and um, and spaces called varieties is very much at the heart of the interaction. Um, so in this concrete example, for example, we would be looking at the ring of, of, of polynomials in two variables modulo this quadratic um, polynomial. Now, uh, algebraic geometers often work with shapes, uh, geometric spaces in projective space. So uh, I'm not going to give a formal definition uh, here of projective space because it's not um, so important. It's a certain compactification of affine space, which you can think of as um, directions in a space one dimension bigger. Um, and then because um, there's a change of perspective, the equations you would be looking at are not just arbitrary polynomial equations, but homogeneous polynomial equations, polynomial equations which have the same overall degree in the vari variables you have. And so the geometric spaces corresponding to that are called projective varieties. So for example, a projective plane conic is given by a homogeneous quadratic equation. So um, for example, this projectivized, what's called a projectivized circle. So I take this kind of Fermat-like equation, x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals zero, or you could call it the Pythagorean equation that defines a projective conic in the projective plane. So we're changing our perspective on, on the space side. So um, uh, what, what sort of spaces are there um, in projective geometry? So projective varieties include um, the d-dimensional projective space um, and products of projective spaces, hypersurfaces given by one homogeneous polynomial, such as these plane curves, or also in general spaces defined by many polynomial equations in a projective space. And so the last sort of context slide is that just as we had rings before, projective varieties come with what are called graded rings. So graded rings um, are, are rings which have a direct sum decomposition into, into pieces um, um, and the, the pieces are graded by polynomial degree. And so for example, projective plane itself as a graded ring, for example, over the real numbers, um, it's a, a ring in three variables, which gets graded by polynomial degree. So in degree uh, R, I have um, polynomials uh, of, of total degree R in X, Y, and Z. And so every polynomial can be decomposed into graded pieces, and that corresponds to this direct sum decomposition. And so what is this talk um, about? This will, this will be a talk about how to find graded rings with interesting structure from the combinatorics of polytopes in a lattice. So that's what that's what I'm going to going to explain. Are there any questions at this stage? I'm very happy to take questions. Um, this is a very general discussion, so I don't know exactly how many of you have seen it. I'm going to go to concrete mathematics from now on. But are, are there any questions? Um, so if not, then... Um, I can switch to the main topic of the talk, which is integral polytopes. So we start with a lattice. So that's some integer lattice of dimension D for some fixed natural number. And for, for a while, um, the D is going to be two, the two dimensional lattice. And then integral polytope is the convex hull. So it's the, 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 con the, the span in the sense of convex geometry of a finite number of lattice points in the lattice. So here are some examples right away. So I have three polytopes here, three plain uh, lattice polytopes. So lattice triangle, a lattice square, and then this pentagon on the right. So these would be, um, so the black dots are representing the um, <laughs> the lattice points and you should imagine as, that as it's, a, it's an infinite lattice, but inside the infinite lattice, I take a finite number of lattice points and I look at the convex hull, the area um, they enclose. And then, so here are some three-dimensional examples. I could take the tetrahedron. Um, in three dimensions, I could take the cube, or also I could take a lattice octahedron, which is which is the last one on the right-hand side. So these are also lattice lattice polytopes. So the tetrahedron is spanned by the origin, and then the three unit vectors or three unit vertex vertices. Then the cube is spanned by sort of the the these as, but also their translates. So it has eight vertices, and then there is a lattice, lattice octahedron also. So actually, these examples generalize to any dimension 
as the d-dimensional simplex, the d-dimensional hypercube, and the d-dimensional cross polytope. So actually, these uh, polytopes are exist in all dimension. Okay, so what can we ask about a lattice polytope, about an integral lattice polytope? So one, one thing you can ask, the simplest possible question you could ask is about the volume. You know, compute the d-dimensional vol Euclidean volume of your lattice polytope. It sets in RD. RD has the normal measure, Riemannian measure, or Lebesgue measure, or uh, Haar measure, what you want to call it. And so you can just ask, you know, find the volume. Another thing you could ask is the discrete volume and the number of lattice points inside it. And you might, you know, the intuition is that these two might are somehow related. So the two should have something to do with each other. If we have a larger volume, uh, we have um, more, more space inside our polytope, then we should have more lattice points and the other way around. But if you start to make calculations, it's, this is, the, the relationship is sort of not so obvious. So here are some examples for d equals two. So you can look at the volumes here. So the first is a, is a, is a little, lattice triangle. So the Euclidean volume works so that the, the whole uh, square, little lattice square has volume one or area in this case. Um, so the triangle has area half. Uh, so this is area half, area one. And then you can compute, um, you can very easily calculate the volume of the last um, uh, lattice polytope also, it has two full squares, so that's got area two, two half squares at the top, so that's three, and then the sort of bigger triangle on the right also gives an area of one, so you have a total area of four. Now, of course, it's also easy to calculate the lattice points, the discrete volume. There are three lattice points in the first case, four lattice points in the second case, and a total of eight lattice points in the third case. So you might ask, okay, so um, what is the what is the relationship between these? And so there's no clear, okay, there's no clear relationship here between the numbers. Um, so our intuition is sort of correct. If the numbers go up on the top, the numbers go up at the bottom also, but there's no clear function type relationship. Um, so the problem is somehow that if you if you think about what happens here, the problem is that the boundary has quite a lot of lattice points. Actually, in the first two cases, all the lattice points are on the boundary. And that somehow gets calculated too heavily, too, too much. It comes with a too big a contribution. So what's the solution? And that, uh, the simplest possible solution you might think of actually works in this case. The idea is count the boundary with halfway. Let's see what happens if you count the boundary with halfway. Um, we calculate a kind of modified discrete volume at the bottom. I say the first um, object has no lattice points inside the triangle. It has three lattice points. That counts as half. So I get three halves for that sort of modified discrete volume. In the second case, I get zero plus four over two. So that's two. In the last case, I have two interior lattice points and then six on the boundary. That should count half maybe. So I get five. And now if you compare the top row and the bottom row, now you see a clear relationship between the numbers. The area seems to be one less than this modified volume. And that's indeed true. That is Pick's theorem. I think it's a very nice and elegant uh, result in uh, um, polytope or polygon geometry that for an integer planar polygon, the area can be calculated by this very nice formula. You take the internal lattice points, half the the lattice points on the perimeter and take away one. And that's your area. Okay, so that's very nice. And uh, you might think that's great. Well, well, we solved the problem. Something like this is gonna work in higher dimensions. But then you start thinking about higher dimensions and you say, okay, so I've got the boundary, but then it's no longer just a kind of one dimensional boundary. It's a, say I have a, if I go back to our three dimensional pictures, these have a two dimensional boundary but it's now stratified. So there will be there will be lattice points on the faces, there'll be lattice points along the edges. So say, okay, let's start weighting them. So the same thing is more complicated. And now it turns out that no one knows such a formula, quite such a formula. Okay, maybe I'll take that back. I'm not sure that's true, but there's no simple formula of that sort. Um, I think there's a complicated formula you can somehow write down, but there's no simple formula. Uh, which is like Pick's formula 
which uh, would compute um, the volume in terms of simple, simple um, counts. So you have to do something more complicated. So what's the idea? Um, so, okay, you say I have my body, some my larger dimensional body. I want to uh, reduce the effect of the boundary. So how could I do that? So somehow what's one key idea about D dimensions is that if you kind of increase um, a D dimensional body, the interior somehow scales differently from the boundary. So the interior scales with um, the volume is sort of power to the D, the boundary scales with some area to the D minus one. So as you increase, somehow you get more and more weight to the inside of your body and not so much to the perimeter. So that's the idea. So the idea is to, to look at dilations of your, of your polytope and see what happens. And another way to think about this, which is maybe, I don't know if there are any applied mathematicians in the audience, but this is, you can think of it in a different way. You can think of keeping your original polytope, but taking a lattice, which is twice as dense or three times as dense or four times as dense. So you sort of discretize your situation, but it's finer and finer subdivisions. So that's another way to think of the same thing that I compress my polytope back, but the lattice got finer. So that's another way to think about it. But be as it may, we can define a counting function. So this is EPR. So this is the number of lattice points. So this is a function of R now. It's no longer just a single number. Um, and it's the number of lattice points uh, inside a, dilate, a dilated um, polytope or polygon. So what are these numbers? So on the left-hand side, I have three and then six and then 10 and so on. On the right-hand side, the number is four lattice points, then nine, then 16, and so on. And in fact, at least in these examples, it's very easy to write down um, the lattice point count. So the lattice point count is a function of R. So in the first case, uh, for a triangle, we get the R plus first triangle number. Uh, there's always a shift here. So um, for... Um, the polygon itself, I get the second triangle number, which is three, then the third triangle number, which is six, and so on. And similarly, there is a um, very easy formula for the number of lattice points inside the square, the R times dilated square, and that's just R plus one to the square, R plus one yeah, square. So that's the R plus first square number. And then for the last one, well, okay, so this needs a bit of an argument. Um, but there is a there is a nice formula also for the number of lattice points um, in um, in R times dilated um, uh, pentagons, um, so of that pentagon shape. Okay, so that's the lattice point count, um, and I've already marked one interesting feature of this lattice point count. So there are there are several interesting features, but one thing you could notice is the red numbers. So the red numbers are the leading coefficient of the polynomial we got as our lattice point count. Um, and so the leading coefficients here are half, uh, one, and four. And you may notice that that precisely agrees uh, with the areas that we computed earlier. Okay, so that's that in fact is our next theorem. So the theorem, well, this is a classical theorem of Erhard from the 1960s. So the theorem says that the counting function of an integral polytope is always um, a polynomial of this value r. It's the so-called Erhard polynomial. And it has a number of interesting properties. So it has the following properties. Um, the constant term of the polynomial is equal to one. Uh, the degree is equal to the dimension. And the leading coefficient is equal to the Euclidean volume. So this is a, a very nice result. And it's a, it can be seen as a generalization of, of um, um, uh, of a big theorem that there is a way to get from the discrete geometry, from the combinatorics, there is a way to get the volume, which is a, a continuous invariant, but you have to do this um, mesh subdivision or, or dilation process. And then to leading order, you recover the volume of the polynomial. Um, so this works in arbitrary dimension and the combinat a precise combinatorial content on the other coefficients is, is under active study. So here we are touching contemporary research already. Um, 
some of the other coefficients are well understood and, and, and some others are, it's not so clear what the other coefficients of the Erhard polynomial is. So um, in two dimensions, there is a very easy expression. Uh, so the leading coefficient is the volume, and then the second coefficient will be related to the number of lattice points on the on the boundary, and then you have the constant term one. And this is why Pick's theorem takes on such a sort of simple, simple shape, that also the Erhard polynomial in two dimensions has a rather simple structure. So here are some more examples. So the, the simplest possible ones, the, the, if you dilate the, um, the tetrahedron and if you dilate the cube, um, you get uh, volume is, is one sixth um, of a tetrahedron. And of course, one for a, a three-dimensional volume of a three-dimensional unit cube is, is of course one. Um, and the lattice point count um, is here. So this cubic, the first cubic polynomial looks a little bit scary, but in fact, it's just a shifted binomial coefficient as before. And it's just what you could call it the um, tetrahedron numbers. Um, and on the right, we have cubes. So this is just R plus one cubed. And you see again, this um, basic structure uh, that the, the leading coefficient is the volume, the degree is, is three, and the last coefficient is uh, is just one. Uh, uh, Professor Balaj, yeah. how, how, how do we get uh, uh, the coefficients of uh, R square and R? So well, okay, so here um, it's a calculation. Um, what I'm saying is here, I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot write, I don't, uh, but this, this coefficient here, uh, sorry, this polynomial here, one six R cubed plus R squared plus blah, 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 is exactly the same as this polynomial, R plus one, R plus two over two. So this is just R plus one, R plus two, R plus three over six. In this case, it's a very easy combinatorial formula. It's just a formula for what you could call tetra, tetrahedral numbers. Now, more generally, it's a calculation. Um, and there is very good um, symbolic algebra software. There's a software, a piece of software called Polymake, for example, which calculates this for you right away. Um, so in, in general, if you want to do these calculations, then, well, either you somehow, you have to prove a, prove a formula, which is often proved by induction, or, or you, can, you, you can use Polymake to, to make actual calculations for you if you kind of don't want, if you feel lazy. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Hello, sir. Sir, how, how you are deciding uh, uh, R? I didn't get it. How you are deciding R? So R is just the number of dilations. How big? So you see the R is the one, the two, the three. So I do R equals one, R equals two, R equals three, R equals four. That's my R. Okay, so here you can see, for example, look on the right-hand side. I can take P, 2P, 3P. P has four lattice points. 2p has 9, 3p has 16, and then r times p is going to have r plus 1 squared lattice points in this case, because basically it's just a square with r plus 1 at the bottom, r plus 1 going up, and so there's r plus 1 squared. So that's the that's the r plus 1 square in the middle column on this slide. Okay, so that's my r, how big a dilation I'm taking. Is that fine? Yeah, yeah, so it's R fine. Equals Thank zero, you. R equals zero is the constant coefficient. And R equals zero means I'm taking zero times my polytope. So that's just the origin, right? I've shrunk my polytope to the origin. So somehow the fact that the leading coefficient, uh, sorry, the constant term is one, just says that at R equals zero, this formula should be correct. R equals zero means I'm taking zero times my polytope. That's just a zero vector. There's one lattice point there. Okay? So that's the R. And here again, I would count the dilations. I would count, for example, on the right-hand side, I would take a cube, uh, blow, sort of multiplied, sort of expanded R times, dilated R times. So that's got R plus one lattice points in three dimensions. So the answer is R plus one cubed. And that polynomial is just R plus one cubed expanded. Okay, so now to rings. So um, to every integral polytope, one can associate a graded ring. So I'm not going to define you precisely um, how to, to formally define this graded ring. Instead, I'm just going to explain it to you with a picture. Each of the dots in this picture, also the one at the bottom corresponding to zero, that's, that's an element in this ring. Um, that's, the, the, that's, the, that's the unit at the bottom. And then at level P, 
there are some polynomial generators at level 2p, there are some polynomial generators at level 3p, there are some polynomial generators. And then the relations between these, these generators are somehow dictated exactly by the geometry. So because everything is so nicely layered, that immediately gives you a grading on this ring. So you have level one elements or grade one elements, grade two elements, grade three elements, and so on. And this you can do with an arbitrary polytope. And all you do is you take these dilations and use an extra dimension to put them together in these layers. So you get some kind of cone type shape and that's your graded ring. Um, now to a graded ring, as I explained um, in my preamble, you can associate a projective variety. It's so-called proj. And then it turns out it's a very simple, um, basically it's, it's more or less by definition, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, it agrees this graded, um, uh, the, 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 the Erhard polynomial that we've been studying agrees with what's called the Hilbert polynomial of the projective variety. Um, so the Hilbert polynomial as some very basic invariant of a projective variety, which just calculates the dimension of each graded piece. So it's very similar um, to computing lat values. In fact, exactly the same as counting lattice points. And so it turns out that there are many interesting connections between the convex geometry of the polytope, the algebra of the graded ring, and the projective geometry of the projective variety. So the rest of the talk will basically give one example of, of how this works. Uh, but before I go to the one example, here are some, some more general examples. So for example, for the triangle, the graded ring um, is just, uh, has just three generators. These are the X, the Y, and the Z in, in degree one. And it turns out that all other generators are in fact coming from these ones. So you don't actually need to put in new generators. So um, that's the graded ring. For the square, the graded ring has four generators. But then there is one relation between these, one quadratic relation between these four generators. So this ring um, is um, uh, this ring is. Uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I just need to quit. Okay, it will stop. Sorry, I've slightly lost control over my computer. Um, yeah, just one second. Um, okay. Um, so the projective variety that corresponds to these examples is uh, the projective plane, P2, on one side. Um, it's a variety called um, product of two projective lines, P1 cross P1 in the, um, in the middle. That's the one corresponding to the square. And then on the right-hand side, um, there is uh, uh, another sort of projective variety, which which is a blow up of P2. In fact, I'm lying a little bit. It's a blow up of something called a weighted P2, a weighted projective plane. So these are the projective varieties. Um, and then the, the, the Hilbert polynomial, Erhardt Hilbert polynomial are the ones that we've seen already. This half R squared plus three halves R plus one. That's the Hilbert polynomial of projective space. And this R squared plus two R plus one for, for P1 cross P1 and, and this other thing we saw before. So um, these are, these are some, some more general examples. And, um, and in general, what you get are called projective toric varieties. So you get what are called projective toric varieties in, in this way. On the uh, uh, side. Professor Balaj, uh, will you please explain uh, uh, the generator of uh, the second algebra, how x g minus y z? Yes, OK. So imagine that, um, so I have, maybe I'll actually show it on, 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 on this picture. Um, so in level 0, we just have the constant basically that's 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 the unit mm -hmm. um and um sorry
Right. I'm really sorry about this. I can't seem to stop it. I'm really sorry. Um... Uh, I think it should stop now. I'm sorry. Um, so, okay, uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, so on the first level, there are four lattice points. So these are generators. Um, and I'm going to call them X, Y, Z, and T. But what I said is that the, the, the relations between these generators comes be because of the, um, of the geometry. And what happens here is that I have four vectors here in free space, but they satisfy a linear relation that the first one plus the, the other one is this one plus this one. And if I translate that into um, a relation between the generators, I get precisely precisely this, that two of the generators multiply and two other generators multiply. So, so in this ring, uh, linear um, uh, relations between, um, between vectors gets translated into um, uh, a polynomial relation between, um, between the generators, basically. So that's, that's how it happens. And, and it so happens in this case that at higher levels, you don't really need new generators because everything comes from the lower level. In theory, we could have generators on higher levels, but not in this case. So in this case, actually, this ring is generated in degree one. So you don't need to worry about other generators. It's, it's really a, a, a quite simple thing. If I only had the, um, the triangle, then the triangle would have three generators and no relation at all because these three don't satisfy any, there's no linear dependency, and then everything at higher level comes from things at lower level, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what the ring is, so, I mean, these rings get complicated. I mean, in these simple cases, you can describe them very simply, um, and then these other cases, it's it's kind of harder to describe. I mean, there's gonna be several generators and, and, and relations. So this is now into the, properly in the subject of like, how do you describe a graded ring? So Imran and various, I mean, Qureshi and other people have thought about this for decades, right? I mean, how do you describe a graded ring? But this is one combinatorial description of a, of a class of graded rings that you get here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to give a, a general example. And the general example is going to be the example of the hypercube. So what's the hypercube? So that exists in any dimension. So here is the four-dimensional hypercube one artist's impression of a four-dimensional hypercube. So you, it's like you go from square to cube by translating your square unit distance and taking the convex hull, and you kind of do the same in four dimensions, except that it's not so easy to draw, but of course, mathematically, we can study it. There is a graded ring, which is somewhat complicated to describe. This one is not yet impossible to describe. It has basically one generator for each of the um, uh, two to the D um, vertices of the cube, and it's got a large number of relations in general. Um, the projective variety, on the other hand, that corresponds to it is, is quite easy to describe and is quite well known. It's a default product P1 cross P1 times times P1 in what's called its Sagram bedding. So this is a very classical projective um, variety. So for D equals three, for example, is P1 cross P1 cross P1 in P7. This is something that, again, Iran spends a lot of his time thinking about, and, and there are other um, um, and in general, it's a sort of quite a well-known variety. So as a variety, it's not it's not so interesting. And even the R-Hart-Hilbert polynomial is um, even the R-Hart-Hilbert polynomial is not so uh, uh, difficult to describe. Sorry, let me just go back to. Uh, full screen. Um, I'm sorry. So the Erhard Hilbert polynomial is also quite easy. It's just r plus one to the d. Um, now we have the Erhard Hilbert series. So what do I do here? So I take, I said this before, but I didn't write a formula. I take the dimension of each of the graded pieces of this of this ring. And with a new variable, I arrange it into a generating function. So this is a very, very common theme in um, 
in projective geometry, this, um, uh, this Hilbert series, or in this case, the Elhart Hilbert series, because in this case, everything comes from the, from the polytopes, this number is exactly the Erhardt, the value of the Erhardt, poly, um, uh, Erhardt polynomial at R. So this is exactly this R plus one to the D um, that we have, we have here in the line above. So uh, this is an example of what's called an Eulerian sum. Uh, so I just take numbers to the D and use them as coefficients. So here are some easily computable basic cases. So some of these series come up in calculus courses in, in undergraduate. Um, in the undergraduate curriculum. So I could take one plus two T plus three T squared, 40 cubed, or one plus four T plus nine T squared, 16 T cubed, or with the cube numbers also. And then on the right-hand side, you get these nice formulae that it's um, the denominator is one minus T to some power. And then there is a numerator, which seems to be um, a nice polynomial of T. And in fact, there is a general proposition. This was known to Euler. Um, that um, the sum, if you do it in uh, for the exponent d, um, it has a numerator, a d of t, uh, which is the d Eulerian polynomial, a polynomial of degree d minus one. And I'm not sure if Euler knew this, but it has it always has non-negative integer coefficients. And then you have a denominator, which is one minus t to the d plus one. Uh, uh, Professor Balash. Uh... Yeah. And so are, are these polynomials relate with some H polynomial or some simplicial complexes or something? Yes, yeah, that's, because, that's, because... that's precisely that. These are the H star. These are the H star polynomials. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's exactly what it is. This is the H star polynomial of the hypercube. Yeah. Um, so what is it? So this, this polynomial is quite special. It's the Dth Eulerian polynomial, AD of T, because it can be expressed as a sum of elements of the symmetric group. So the symmetric group is now a new uh, new uh, player for us. It's um, the group of permutations. Um, and um, so here is a, a very nice formula, uh, AD of T. Uh, one thing we could have noticed before is if you look at the sum of the coefficients is one, two, and six. This, this is just one factorial, two factorial, three factorial. Um, and in fact, it's a positive sum over elements of the symmetric group. So we take... Uh, elements of the symmetric group, uh, and each of them, we raise t to the what's called the descent uh, of the permutation, where uh, descent denotes the number of descents of uh, sigma. It's an invariant of a permutation. What's that? So if I write the permutation in a row of numbers, one, three, two, then every time um, the next number goes down compared to the previous number, that's a descent. So three, two, one has two descents. Three to two to one, that has two descents. One, three, two has one descent because it descends at three. So that's that's the descent. And so you get a, you get this nice um, nice polynomial, which is the um, the descent, which is called a descent the polynomial, Eulerian descent polynomial. And so these formulae establish a very nice connection between the Erhard theory of the d-dimensional hypercube, the projective geometry of this projective variety, and the symmetric group. And um, so everything here is, is so far very well known, but the next step, it seems, was, was the step we took, well, it's, it's not so well known. So in the uh, uh, next couple of slides, I'm going to explain the bit of work that, that we did in this area. Um, and the starting point is um, a bi-grading. Um, so it turns out that the connection goes further. So with, uh, with my colleague, Praise Adeyemo at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, we studied a bigraded version of this story. So a bigraded version geometrically corresponds to slicing our polytope with parallel hyperplanes. So the, the picture you should have in mind is this. So I have my polytope and these dilations, but I'm also slicing orthogonal to some direction. And now I'm going to count um, lattice points um, also where I remember which slice they came in. So that gives me a new variable. So this was co considered by, by Chapoton some time ago, not so long ago, a few years back. You count lattice points in hyperplanes. So he gave a generalization of Erhard theory, where instead of um, the Eulerian, sorry, that should be Erhard polynomial. I'm sorry, that's a misprint. So that should be um, Erhard. Instead of the Erhard polynomial EP of R, we have a refinement, which is EP of R and Q with some um, quantity Q. And these are some very interesting functions now of 
a mixture between it's a kind of polynomial of of Q. In fact, it's a polynomial of, of, of expressions of Q. In fact, it's kind of a polynomial in what are called Q numbers. So that was the that was the generalization um, that we considered. And so on the algebraic geometry side, this fits in very well because I told you that there is a, a kind of grading on in the in the picture one dimension higher, which already came from slicing in some sense. So now we are sort of slicing orthogonal to that. And if then you can repackage the whole thing in terms of what's called a bigrading. So a bigrading is where you uh, you grade your ring not but not with one integer, but with with two integers. So that's somehow very natural in this context, and um, you get this um, you get this story of um, uh, bigraded rings corresponding to this refinement of Erhard theory. Now you can. Um, you can do some calculations and you can return, for example, to the d-dimensional hypercube. You choose this diagonal slicing and we, there is a refined um, Erhardt polynomial or refined Erhardt expression. And then you get a, this, a, a refined Erhardt series. So this is now where you take these refined polynomials and you calculate, you put in a, um, a new variable t and you consider something over, over, uh, over all r. And so one of our one of our results in this little piece of work we did was we computed this um, for this uh, for this diagonal slicing and we got a very nice answer. So this is the shape of the answer. So this refined Hilbert Erhardt series of the hypercube. Again, there is a numerator and then there is a denominator. The denominator is somehow um, has some very clear structure, and then the numerator is uh, what's called the the Euler. McMahon polynomial, which enumerates um, descent and major index of a permutation. So here, the major index is you take your permutation and you add up the positions where descent happens. That's called the major index. And if you account for both descent and major index, then you get this two variable polynomial, still with positive coefficients or non-negative coefficients. And that two variable polynomial with non-negative coefficients is going to uh, give us uh, the refined or bigraded um, Hilbert series of, um, of the hypercube. We did some other calculations. You can also repeat this calculation for, um, well, the, the, tetra, the polyhedron is, sorry, the, um, uh, the tetrahedron or, or the, the simplex in D dimensions. That's really not so interesting because the structure of the ring is very simple, but uh, there is a nice little calculation you can also do for um, the octahedron or the hyperoctahedron. Um, where you get some, the results are not so interesting. You get, you can do the calculation and um, the results are actually pretty straightforward, um, but explain some phenomena that were observed observed earlier uh, in connection with, with the hyperoctahedron. Uh, Professor uh, Balash, uh, yes. this, this, this result only hold for hypercubes, right? Right, so this, this particular result is for hypercubes. Let me, um, um, there, there are, as, as I say, we have computations also for the um, uh, simplex and for the hyperoctahedron, which are in some sense simpler. Um, uh, in general, this is quite hard. So let me just go to my, my, my next slides, which will talk a little bit about you know, possible further, further directions here. So one thing uh, you can do, I mean, these things exist in, for, for any polytope, but I think computing them will be harder. Um, uh, one interesting direction you can go is you can take your hypercube and chop it at a certain height. So if you chop it at height one, you get back the simplex, but you can chop it at height two, height three, all the way to height r. So you get these chopped versions of, of a hypercube. Um, and the Erhard theory of those is, is interesting and it relates to yet another uh, permutation index called the exceedance index. Um, but the refined story is not understood. And I think this may be quite interesting to study. So that's one direction we are thinking, um, just to make some further calculations to, to see how uh, we can link um, to some, some, some other, perhaps some other interesting, interesting polynomials uh, in connection with the symmetric group. Um, as it turns out, the, the same uh, subject also has connections to matroids, to group actions, to, um, to representation theory of the symmetric group in particular. So there are, there are many interesting directions that um, one could take this research further. Okay, thank you very much.
thank you thank you very much thank you professor uh, now it's time to uh, take few questions uh, from the audience uh, are there any questions so you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly to professor balash uh, so hil you have uh, mentioned one question uh, could you please speak up uh, hello can you hear me Hi. yep yeah okay so my question is uh, uh, a bit irrelevant, but you know, is there a kind of classification like which projective varieties can be obtained in this way, something like that? Yeah. So uh, this is just toric variety. I mean, the way I explain it is just just toric varieties. I mean, this in projective toric varieties. I mean, there's a basic. Uh, this is basically Butterev's observation that if you have a projective toric variety, you can always construct it this way. Uh, but it's only so. This is. I mean, the story I explained is is really from the pr point of view of varieties. It's it's, it's it's rather limited. Now, of course, you can start taking complementary sections in these varieties. And as you know, you know, we can make other mm. constructions. But this this particular story, the the the, the precise link between polytopes and um and, and Erhard theory and, and, and Hilbert's um Hilbert functions, that's that that that's exactly the class of projective toric varieties. Now you can you can ask more general questions. So for example, a very interesting story that I haven't looked into so much, but it's um it's it's really interesting. Is what if you take rational polytopes? If you take rational polytopes, then on the um on the Erhard side you get quasi polynomials, and on the projective side you get like these uh, ice cream type functions that Miles Reed likes so much. These kind of periodic periodic corrections to the Hilbert function. So that's some that basically corresponds to kind of orbifolds, orbifolds of toric varieties, if you want. Um, yeah, so that's that that's another that's another direction to go into. This has links also to tropical geometry. That that there are many links, but the, the most straightforward class to which this basic thing applies is is projective projective toric toric varieties. You can also think of equivariant picture of an equivariant picture where you have some group acting. And then you could you could study. So this is something that people started doing in the last few years, uh, computing equivariant Erhard expressions, where the your expression takes values in the representation ring of some finite group, for example. If your polytope has some symmetry that corresponds to some automorphism on the algebra geometric side, you have some toric variety with an automorphism, and then you can study its equivariant Hilbert function, equivariant Erhard theory. There are also some very interesting connections to combinatorics there. And uh, Balash, uh, what about uh, its connection with the uh, the subdivision of uh, sub the theory of subdivision, like barycentric subdivision of uh, hypercube? Yes, and right. Something? So that's certainly a way to prove some of these results. So um, uh, one way to prove, if you if you look in books on like combinatorics of polytopes, they would prove even this basic result to this Erhard, even the existence of an Erhard polynomial or some of its properties would be proven by subdividing your polytope into simplices and putting it together. And yes, yeah, so there are, there are ways this, this of course, works with subdivision and, and so on. I'm not really an expert on that, but that's certainly kind of one way to go. I'm really more interested in, in, in connections with, with projective geometry. So if you go in the, so for example, if you go from the simplex to the hypercube, so one is just D-dimensional projective space. The other one is P1 to the D, uh, projective line to the dth power. These are actually birational toric varieties. And going between through these chopped polytopes is, is kind of like war crossing. You do birational changes from mm -hmm. one projective variety to another one. So bi so biocentric subdivision might correspond to a blow up. Some mm -hmm. there are, there are the, the there's a lot of a lot of the combinatorial constructions you could do correspond to something on the projective geometry side also. Could yeah be because uh, because uh, there is a natural yeah there is a natural way to obtain the h vector uh, because of there there exists some and when once one get the h vector then we have this particular formula right right uh, right similar formula or at least methods of proof for a lot of erhard theory it would go by decomposing your polytope into simplices and then putting it together yeah exactly Absolutely. thank you uh, are th are there any questions from the audience or comments uh, yes sir uh, do we get some uh, interesting uh, relation like, or, or can we calculate something which gets the something in higher co-dimension stuff for? Yes, no, I mean, of course, that's very much one of my, my interests in this, as you know. Um, um, 
uh, I don't know. I mean, of course, P1 cross P1 cross P1 in P7, that's been studied endlessly by a large number of people. Already the next one, of course, the co-dimension is big. So then I remember there are two to the D variables. So the next one is P1 cross P1 cross P1 cross P1 in P15. I asked Miles if he knows anything about that or if if is anything known, and he sort of he was sort of shrugging his shoulder. The the, the co-dimension goes up exponentially. The co-dimension is two to the d minus d plus one or something like that. So oh, yeah. it very quickly gets out of control. But but uh, yeah, but I haven't given up thinking that maybe you can get some interesting information out of out of this. I have a follow-up project where it's not exactly local dimension rings but it's it's using this setup to and the equivariant setup to 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 find some interesting things so i think there is interesting commutative algebra here and interesting projective geometry but the most straightforward thing pretty soon falls apart because the co-dimension is exponential so um uh yes so that's a short answer but um but yes, I mean, I think I'd like to continue thinking about that, but I can't give you any firm conclusions. Uh, hello, I'm Don. Yep. Yeah, it's a, a kind of relevant question uh, to Imran's question. So uh, is there a kind of explanation of unprojection within these uh, lattices? Like what is the There are, not, not an explanation, not, not, not an explanation. Explanation. I mean, you can do, you can find some examples of projections and unprojections among these projective toric varieties and polytopes. In fact, that was a different project with a different African colleague of mine, my student Jeffrey, where we wrote a recent paper where suddenly we played with some polytopes and there was a non-normal polytope and there was a, suddenly there was a birational map which looked a bit like an unprojection. So these things certainly show up in examples. I don't think you're going to get an explanation, but 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 in that case, what happened was precisely what happens in some unprojection constructions that you're kind of losing one or you have to put in some extra generator with some extra variables because something isn't generated in degree one. But so we, we, we see examples of 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 these standard Maisian constructions um, occurring. I, I'm not I don't think you'll get an explanation of it. I think it I, it's you get like nice examples where where you can study some explicit example of, of how it all happens. I mean general unprojection is some extremely general procedure in commutative algebra. I don't think that's going to be explained by by a few lattice points, but you get examples. And and in relatively uncomplicated cases, you already need we used uh, polymake, we used Macaulay 2. I mean, you know, you do need computer algebra to really study what's going on. Um, and there's certainly some fun calculations you can make. So it's not an explanation, but it's some nice examples of these things. So are there any written examples on the internet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My paper with Jeffrey and Boya is on the internet. We have a paper on uh, K3 vibrations in uh, in uh, 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 weighted uh, weighted flag varieties, a weighted cross. Um, and if you look in the last section there, there is a there is one fully worked example of exactly. weighted, weighted scrolls. I, I was the one with weighted flag, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weighted scrolls. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> weighted scrolls. Um, so um, yeah, so that's a, that's a recent paper, and there we just bumped into one of these examples, which which has a nice explanation in terms of polyhedral geometry. So I hope the list of questions conclude. Uh, are there any other questions from uh, any of the audience? So please uh, unmute yourself. Go ahead. OK, if this is the case, uh, let us thank Palash for a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful talk. And uh, I think uh, uh, many of us got a lot of things, uh, many interesting things in one lecture. So that's that's wonderful, Balash. Uh, thank you, and we hope thanks, to thanks have you. Uh, thanks, we uh, and we hope that we will uh, keep you having in our John Conway series so often and and in person, future and in person too. Sometimes, okay. sometimes I'm <laughs> happy. Look, I'm happy to stay around and chat a bit if people want to chat a bit. I don't know if anyone still has some time, but maybe we could turn off turn off the recording and then we could um um have a. Chat. I'm happy to chat to people just informally mm -hmm. if people still. Um... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, there, there are. Yeah. Oh, okay, allow me to introduce a few people. <laughs> you know Imran Qureshi, you know Suhail. So there's one of 